hearts, Lord. Uh, we invite your, your sweet spirit into this building, Lord. And we just pray that uh, no word come out of my mouth that is not uh, proved and, and wanted by you. And pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, y'all ain't going to have to flip very far today in the Bible to get to the reading point. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. And uh, this is, a, I hate saying a favorite book of the Bible for me, because they're all really good. But Genesis is one of my favorites. And I can tell you it's one of my favorites, because uh, I like to do a recap of you know, where we're at in the book whenever I start. And I got two pages of notes on re recap on Genesis 1 and 2. Because it's one of the deepest books, I think. Because it's Genesis. It's the beginning. But uh, before we get to today, today's reading, like uh, in Genesis 1, we have uh, the creation. You know, uh, day 1, uh, created time, light, heavens and earth. Day, uh, second day, the sky and the seas. Third day, land and plants. The fourth day, sun, moon, stars and planets. Fifth day, fish and birds. Sixth day, animals of the land er, and man. And uh, Genesis 1 ends with uh, Genesis 31. And God saw that, uh, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. After he makes everything, he says, this is good, this is good, this is good. It's all good. Now we get to Genesis 2. It's the second creation story. But on the seventh day, God rested. And then God creates man. He makes us out of uh, dust and breathes life into us. And then God creates the garden. You know, in, in, the, in, in creation, after he creates everything, it is good. The only time that he didn't say that it is he didn't say it was bad, but he said it was incomplete. It was whenever God created man, he needed a helper, so he sent the Eve. But then it was very good. So God creates the garden in uh, Genesis 2, chapter, or in verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. There he put man who, had, uh, who he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then we were given this one command. The Lord God took the, took the man, put him in the garden to work and keep it. And then the Lord God commanded the man saying... You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the, knowledge, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Um, what, I, what I love is, is you take the Bible and you take this much of it, and this is the garden. This is exactly what we were made for. To be in fellowship with God. And it was good. But then you turn the page and then there's chapter 3. And the rest of this book is God's love for us trying to get us back into this garden. But uh, So we're now in chapter 3 and uh, it's the fall. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you should not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch of it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that the, it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. 
Then they opened both of their eyes, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Today's message, I've ta- it's our fall. And the reason why I said that is because I, and I've been guilty of this, you know. The reason why we're here is because Adam and Eve, or Eve, but then I start reading into it. You know, Eve ate of that fruit. There's no denying that. And then some people will be like, well, Eve ate of it. Well, go ahead and look in the Bible about how that argument worked out. Adam was right beside her. And he ate of the same fruit. He took the same temptation. But uh, while reading this, I see it like uh, you can, if you study this, you'll see lust of the eyes, lust, or lust of the flesh, lust, lust of the eyes, and then pride of life. You can boil every temptation that we've ever had down to those three, if you really look at it. And I think that that's a fruit that, um, given our natural state, given our, our fleshly state, we want to eat that fruit every day. You know, we, we put a lot on Adam and Eve, but uh, uh, I know for me at least, I'll keep this on me, that is a fruit that uh, I've always sought. But uh, when we get into it, those three things. So whenever in Genesis 3, we look at uh, the, the lust of flesh. It was good for food. When she saw this, uh, when, when the woman saw the tree was good for food. And then the lust of the eyes, that it was delight to the eyes. And that the tree was desired to make one wise. Now you could say like, what's, you know, would that be the sin that was created? And yeah, I mean, like, that, that's a big one. But I think that the ultimate one starts way before this. It's just simply, den- like, minimizing the Word of God and then doubting the Word of God. So when God gave us that one simple command, it said, you may not surely eat, or you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. So the devil comes, and see, that's the thing about it. Our enemy, the devil, knows this book better than I will ever know it. And that doesn't mean I, can't, I don't need to study it. Like I do. But he knows Scripture, and he knows it very well. So you're telling me that you may, not, or you may surely eat of every tree in the garden... So when Jesus, or when not when uh, the, uh, the the serpent asked the woman, you, "You're telling me that you shall not eat of any tree?" Does God actually say you shall not eat of any tree? She could have been like, "No, that's the best part. We can eat of all of it." She's looking at like all the only thing that she can't do instead of all the things that God has made for her. So. Whenever she says, uh, we, can, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, she's kind of holding back on the actual truth. But uh, she fails to say, uh, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But then the serpent comes back to the woman, and he says, you will not surely die. See, he knows the word of God, sometimes better than us could have been a little hint to her that who she was fighting against. But she doubted the word. You shall surely die. So at first she looks at it and she says that the food is good. Looks good. You know, there's a whole lot of things that are fleshly sin for me that seem good at the time. You know, for me, it could be as simple. Alcohol might appeal to my flesh. Like, I want that release or whatever, but it is not good for me. Uh, there's a lot of things, uh, the food. I can sit there and I can eat. You can ask Abby the other day. I get home, she had made some leftovers, or she had made some food the night before, and I succumbed to the lust of food. And guess what happened? I took a two-hour nap of a carb, carb overdose. It felt good or it seemed good but all I mean like there wasn't nothing wrong with that that food was great but uh, 
whenever I take it too far. Sexual appetite can be the same thing. Anything that can divide us from God. All these things are good. God made them, but are we making them over God? That it was a delight to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. See, she's fighting all these urges. Now, whenever she says that, and the tree was, uh, and that it was a delight to the eyes. I think of how many things for me that are a delight to my eyes. Now, when I think of a delight to my eyes, I think of covetry a lot, because that's kind of where it will lead me. You know, if I sit there and say, Larry, I like your truck. I love that truck. But if I sit out there and I start looking at your truck and say, man, I love that truck. And then I look at my truck. Now I'm not as grateful. But it's nice to be able to be like, man, I love that Colorado out there. It's pretty nice, but yours is sharp too. See, I will get that way. Like I can look at things, but then do I take it too far? I have open eyes. Everything can be good until I make it evil. Uh, we always talk about the covetousness, but like, you know, the house, the car, neighbor's wife. Uh, we have to be careful. In, a, in Ecclesiastes, it talks about, in chapter 2, it talks about the, the, the eyes. We see these beautiful things. They were made to see these beautiful things, but uh, we have to be focused on God. In the pride of life, everything that appeals to haughtiness, feeling superior, arrogance, pride, personal achievement, popularity, success, self-sufficient attitude. And that, and then she, when she gets, says, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise. She took of it, took of the fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who also ate. To be wise. So a little while ago, man, this is probably four or five months ago, I always wanted to be, when it comes to my relationship with God, I always wanted to know this Bible. And it was to know God. Three or four years ago, I wanted to learn everything about this Bible to know God. I wanted to be closer to God. But something happened, and that thing that happened was pride. It took me about six, till six or seven months ago to really notice this. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm reading this book, and I'm praying, and I'm fasting. And then I'm sitting here and I'm just like, man, I just, I don't feel as close as I always did. I had a friend tell me one time, he said, if you're feeling farther apart from God, who, or who moved? Well, God's everlasting. God is faithful. It wasn't him. It was me. So when I look down at this, and I'm sitting here, and I, I, I wanted to know, the problem was, is y'all ever read uh, Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis? It's one of my favorite authors. I was talking about this Tuesday night. And then it takes a unique... Uh, uh, stance on things like you know he was a writer and he wrote from an opinion uh, this is a fictional writing it was written in letter format uh, all these letters would come out in these newspaper radio clippings in World War II and uh, they were written from screw tape uh, is like a senior tempter kind of like the devil and he was writing to his protege and his protege was trying to tempt the, the patient and he would be talking about all these everyday things like prayer. And he would talk about like how the enemy could sit there and work that against us. Well, Scripture. I wanted to know God. But the enemy, all he's got to do is like, I'm going to flame the fan of pride. Now see, six or seven months ago, I could have told you the five points of Calvinism. No problem. I could have told you Arminianism. I could have told you where Catholics stand. I could have told you where Baptists stand. But the problem was, is I couldn't hear the voice of God. I couldn't feel the voice of God. I couldn't feel that spirit. And then I finally realized one day that it wasn't my MacArthur Study Bible. It wasn't my Thompson Chain Bible that was going to lead me more to God. It was getting into the Word of God, praying, and letting the helper that he had sent me help me learn. Uh, that was a big pill to eat, but man, if anything that will uh, result in uh, you know, repentance in my life, I 
I firmly welcome. So when I say our fall, I think that the same temptation is on us today that's always been there. You know, I'm a big sports fan. If there was two bugs flying around this room right now and ESPN covered it, I would watch it. But, uh, you know, I'm a big Kentucky Wildcat fan, you know, and basketball. So if I really believe that if every opponent that Kentucky played this year gave them their, like, playbook, Kentucky would go undefeated. Now, we have the enemy's playbook right here. We know what the devil will come at us with. Now, why? It's, it's, it's more difficult than it seems. Uh, but we have good news, though. Like, it's not like we just get sent down here told, like, this is going to happen. Y'all deal with it the best that you can. Because God's given us a playbook, too. Uh, one of the things that I'm super grateful for is being a Christian and I'm super grateful to God for them, is it's not like, y'all go do this, do as I say. Our God is a do as I do God too. You know, we had our Lord and Savior, 100% God, 100% man, come down here and live. And He's dealt with the same temptations that we had to. The only difference is, is he didn't sin. So now we have a playbook. In Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus uh, talks about this. Now, the, the interesting thing that I find that when Adam and Eve were tempted in the garden, that is as strong as we ever would have been because we we're in fellowship with God. We we're in the garden like we are literally fellowshipping with God every day. Now you take Jesus on the other hand, he is just now coming out of a 40-day fast. This would be the, in a sense, the weakest the flesh would be, but the Holy Spirit led him to this wilderness. And he is following the instruction of the Spirit. So in, G, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, then Jesus was led uh, up by the Spirit into the wilderness and tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be loaves of bread. Talking about tempting of the flesh right there. 40 days, 40 nights. And he knows it. Jesus could have done that. Could have simply easily done that. But Jesus answered, It is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus answered scripture, but he also he knew the scripture. See, the devil tries to play these games with us, and then he can take it out of context. But when you know the word of God, you can't doubt it. Uh, the devil took him uh, to the holy city and set him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against any stone. Any stone. That's Psalm 91 that he's... Uh, not really a misquote. He's just taken it out of context, and he's taken a little part of that. And I really... One of the things that uh, when I read this particular temptation that it really catches me. Right now, I have a bracelet on that has scripture on it. You know, uh, put on the full armor of God. Now, I love wearing these because when I change them up, it makes me think of a... Uh, it's really simple, but it makes me think of the full armor of God. And then whenever I'm sitting there throughout my day, I see it. It reminds me, you know. Uh, but I could take you back in time. Uh, I remember uh, four or five years ago when I was in treatment and I was first introduced to the Word of God and then uh, I would read uh, verses like Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you that are good and not of evil. Plans to prosper you. And I love that. And I remember this woman, she came to me and uh, she really guided me through then. She was like, that's great. 
But keep reading. Because, see, I'll get a verse that I like. I'll get something I like. I'll take it out of that, and I'll be like, I'm going to go with this. But if I'd have kept reading, it says, uh, it goes on to say, well, you will seek me and you will find me only when you find me or seek me with your whole heart. See, that's the thing. I've seen this where it's like people, on their hands, they will bear you up unless you strike your foot. It's tempting. But Jesus said, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to a test. Both times he's there, well, all three times he answers these are all out of Deuteronomy. And again, the devil took to him, uh, took to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him. All three answers that Jesus gave is out of Deuteronomy. The last two were out of Deuteronomy 6. If you look in Deuteronomy 5, that's the Ten Commandments. See, God in Deuteronomy was trying to get a sinful nation to be in his presence because he is a righteous God. But the whole book, it's like we can't... This whole book is just nothing but a love story from God to His people. We fall short, but He still loves us. The reason why that... uh, You know, when I think about all these temptations, I think of one of my favorite verses in uh, in the Bible is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And it's 12 and 13. No temptation has overtaken man that is not common to man. And I find a lot of uh, uh, comfort in that because I know that no matter what, I'm, what tomorrow holds, it's not going to be a new temptation. It might be new to me, but it's not new. It is not common to man. But God's not going to put anything on me that I can't bear through Him. God will be with me. Um, Our fall. When it talks about our, when I'm talking about our fall, it says the fall. You know, if you look at, uh, if you look at the ancient Hebrews, like if you would have asked them, you would have said, like, what are the three, uh, what's the points of uh, fallen creation? They would look at the fall. They would look at Adam and Eve. They would look at uh, the Tower of Babel. And... Some would say the Noah, uh, Noah flood. Some would say it's the fall of Satan. But it starts with Adam and Eve. We're fighting the same enemy that we fought, that Adam and Eve fought. But we have a new answer. In 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16, Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. For whoever does the will of God abides forever. The will of God. My self-will will take me places that the world would love for me to go. See, I have like three enemies in this life that I have. I have the world, worldliness, I have my flesh, and then devil. But I have three uh, key helpers. I have my Holy, the Holy Spirit, I have Jesus, and I have the Father. God gives me what I need. But he also, like I went through with that, uh, he gives us a way out too. Like we're not perfect, but repentance is there. Uh, the key to this is Jesus. When Jesus, in cha- Hebrews chapter 4, see a verse that used to be very, uh, uh, very close to me is in, Jesus, uh, or in Hebrews chapter 13. It talks about, we look at uh, those who taught us the word of God, our teachers. We look at their outcome in life, and then we imitate their ways. I think we have the best teacher in Jesus, and... He's the one that guides us through. So when we go to the altar, one thing that uh, was 
stirring on me when I was going through all that was Jesus saying, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, when I think about that, uh, Abby could text me right now, and I could pull my phone out. No matter what she says, when I read those words, I hear her voice. Regina could text me right now, and I could hear her voice. My mom could text me right now, and I could hear her voice, because I know them so well, and I hear from them so often. One of my things was, was Jesus, would he know my voice? Would I know his voice? Now, when we have an altar call, uh, you have an altar call of fellowships of the saints. This is important, but do we use our prayer closet? You know, the funny thing is, is for me, whenever I get closest is when I get quiet. See, Jason has this uh, contemplative prayer that he's been working on us with, and I absolutely love it. But see, there's moments where life... The world kind of gets me kind of upset inside. Yesterday we had the time of our lives. And then I'm driving home and I need to calm down. I kind of need to sit down and focus. And I tell Abby, I said, listen, I'm going to go work on my sermon. I'll probably be at the lake, you know. And I took my Bible, took my phone with my headphones, and I took a fishing pole. And I'm sitting there and I didn't catch nothing. But I went and I could listen and it was just being still for a minute. And giving God that chance to talk to me. That's how I have the strength for the next temptation that comes my way. Uh, Abby, come, when I come home, she says, how was the sermon? I said, or how was your notes and stuff? And I said, I didn't catch nothing. But I got some peace out of it. So today we're going to open the altar. If God, if you haven't heard his voice or you, he hasn't heard yours, this is a good chance to start. But if you don't know Jesus, and you don't know He's your Lord and Savior. The thing that, that's the biggest thing for me is Adam and Eve doubted God's Word. Do you know that God loves you? Because if you sit there and you say, Ah, oh, God doesn't love me because I've done too much. Look at Samson. He doubted God's Word, but God ended up loving him. Or God loved him because his faith in God. You look at Noah's faith in God. You look at Abraham's faith in God. They weren't perfect, but their faith was when it mattered. So the altars are open. If you would, we'll stand and we'll do an altar call.